This is Dune Talk, a DuneNewsNet.com production. Join us now for the latest Dune news, reactions, and lively discussions. Hey everyone, it's really happening. In 15 days or less, Dune Part 2 will be starting its theatrical run across the globe. Some of us will even be seeing the movie a bit earlier. In the meantime, there are tons of cast interviews for us to dig into. Marcus here, I'm your friendly editor at DuneNewsNet.com, and I'm joined by three excellent Dune Talk co-hosts, all longtime fans of Dune, both the books and their screen adaptations. Hey everyone, it's Garen. Great to be back. Great to be back with uh, Rachel and Mark and Marcus. Um, we're in the thick of it. This is the time period that I, that I really get excited about because once it's out, then I'm all into the film and I forget about all the, all the buildup toward uh, the release. So just excited to talk about it today. Hi, Mark from Junior Info here. Happy to be with the gang again, uh, talking June. Loads of interviews. The press trainers uh, definitely left the station for June part two. Uh, and I'm looking forward to talking to everyone about all the revelations we've discovered so far. Hi, everyone. It's Rachel. I'm excited to be back. And we have a mountain of stuff to talk about. Great. Let's talk Dune part two. Dune movie news. First story, uh, Dolby Cinema has released their official poster for Dune Part 2. This one features Paul and Chani, both with Chris Nice in hand, looking out to the horizon with Arrakis' bright sun and a sandstorm in the background. Uh, Rachel, we've already gotten quite a few posters so far, some impressive, uh, others less so. Uh, do you feel this one captures the feeling of Dune? Yeah, you know, I like that it's a really super vertical format and that we see like the full, like everyone's full bodies and... I think for me, coming at it from kind of like a costumer's like eye, it's just really exciting to see how, you know, all these details that have changed. Um, and I also think that it kind of points towards the more emotional, you know, couple-based, relationship-based uh, point of view that they've been talking about in interviews, that we're, we're not seeing any really action. We're seeing this connection between these two characters as like the main focus of the poster. Yeah, I like the, uh, the fact that we're actually getting the sort of a, an orange Arrakis for once. Yeah. June part one, the, all the posters were very blue sky, uh, which is not how I see it. That's partly David Lynch's fault, perhaps, but you know, <laughs> I, I see Arrakis as very warm and orange and we're getting that uh, with the bright sun behind them. And again, part one, because of the time on the story, there was a lot of it that was at night. So we didn't get that harsh sunlight. And in the background as well, you can see the coming storm rolling across mm -hmm. the desert. Uh, so yeah, uh, one, of, one of my favorite uh, part two posters, I think. Yeah, Arrakis is the third character being shown in that in the poster for sure. I really like the strength that, that you see in both uh, Chani and, and Paul's expressions. You know, I really, they're, they're commanding, they're in charge, they're powerful. I, I really like that. Really a sharp contrast from the, posters for part one mm. and speaking of the formats as mentioned this poster is for dolby cinema which features an incredible audio experience uh, but depending on what theaters you have nearby dolby may be just one of the premium screen formats that you mm -hmm. could choose from there's imax of course but also less common uh, options like uh, uh, 40x or screen x uh, mark i recall that you've tried out uh, already quite a few of these for dude part one uh, even reviewing uh, i think it was the 40x one on, on the website uh, in a nutshell, what are the differences between these uh, premium screen formats and do you have a personal preference? Yeah, sure. So uh, my favorite would have to be IMAX. And if you can see in the 143 ratio, uh, that's ideal, but that's those are quite hard to, to find. Normally it's 1.9 to 1, so slightly taller than normal theatrical uh, ones. Um, the 4DX one is 3D, but also motion seats and mist in your face and smoke effects and smells and lightning effects and stuff. And motion, uh, it's a bit gimmicky, but uh, when you're in a Fopter and your seats are moving as you're flying across the landscape, that, that's quite fun. Uh, you've also got the Screen X, which is a 270 degree screen. So rather than IMAX being really tall, the screen is really wide and it wraps around you. Uh, I've not seen one of those before, but the, there was a trailer posted for part two and there's a Screen X five miles away from me. So I definitely will be trying that out. Uh, Dolby Atmos for the sound. And there's also iSense, which is a big screen and nice sound and stuff. So uh, yeah, uh, personally, I like to experience it as many times as possible in a different 
formats as possible. But uh, if you've only got a choice of one, IMAX is the one to go for. I've seen like a, a video, I guess, of the Screen X. It wasn't like a trailer. It was just like the capabilities of Screen X. Um, and it looked really interesting, but it also looked like if you sat in the front, you might miss you know, some yeah. of the effect of, of, of it, which I thought was interesting because, you know, so often you're trying to make everything as big as possible yeah. instead <laughs> of as wide as possible. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to see what you think about that. For yeah, I don't, film. I think it's only select scenes are filmed in the, the screen. Oh, X. Okay. Um, so normally the trailers are, you know, as soon as you go into a chase scene, a car chase, then suddenly you've got the street around you on either side. Uh, how much will be for June part two? I'm not sure. And as I say, I've never actually tried one before, but uh, as it's coming out in that format, I will be trying it. Yeah, and Garen, knowing you're an audiophile, I want to hear your thoughts on the best way to experience Dune, at least from the sound perspective. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I think I've been able to experience uh, all the different sound formats, I believe. Um, and I'm, I'm with Mark on this one. Uh, ever since I saw The Dark Knight uh, on an IMAX screen years ago, um, that has been my number one go-to cinema experience. I, if there's a film that, that I really get excited about, I, I absolutely want to see it on an IMAX. But what's what's really cool about what's happening now, though, is you've got directors like Villeneuve and Nolan and and others who are now using this as as uh, to enhance their story, to enhance the experience. Um, but what I've also found is those IMAX screens tend to have, in my opinion, the best sound experience. So what I don't like, and I'm not going to go into like uh, audiophile nerd land here, but what I don't like is when the, when the bass sounds are so distracting that you don't even see, you're being taken out of the moment, uh, of the, of the uh, scene. And, and what I, what I love about the IMAX screens that I've been able to experience, uh, a number of Nolan films, as well as, uh, as well as uh, doing part one is that it felt very seamless. So, so you have the surround soundtracks that go behind you and around you, but you're not suddenly turning your head. Like what was that sound over there? Or you're not, your head's not on a swivel. You're, you're in the moment looking forward in the characters, uh, in the drama, but you feel completely immersed. And I've even been able to see, um, on a, not on an IMAX screen, but see Dolby Atmos, uh, on, on a smaller screen. And I, I, as I'm watching it, because the Atmos is so clean and so precise with the sounds, the surround sound, uh, tracks and layers that I, I just was sitting there wishing I was watching it on, on my mics because that to me matching that, that really tall, I don't know how many, how many stories up those IMAX screens are, but you're really looking up into the side. Then you also have this completely immersive sound stage. To me, that's just, that's why I go see these films. Uh, on these on these screens, because I have a home theater and I have a really good sound system, but what I don't have is that just completely awe-inspiring, you know, screen that's bigger than the size of my house. So <laughs> I'm all about an IMAX. I'm with you, Mark, and that's how I'm going to see it on opening night. Yeah, I saw. Um, I, I watched part one again last night because it's the re-release here in the UK, and so stayed for the ten minutes uh, preview of part two and the Samwens scene. And uh, even though it wasn't 4DX, when that sandworm is coming at you and you can feel it, the sound in the bass pump in your chest. Uh, so it was almost a 4DX experience, I think, on just that alone. Now, years ago, I was able to see Star Wars with the Dolby Atmos. And you're right, it was it, it was a smaller screen. It was in New York. So they have like a whole installation there where you can go and like test out different movies. And uh, I did wish it was bigger, but you're right that I, I'm not, I don't necessarily notice um, unless something's messed up or like if the screen is dirty or the bass is too high, like I'll notice that. But the Dolby Atmos, I did notice that it was so clean and so clear. Um, so, yeah, I'm I think like. I've also joked, like, I've watched Dune more on a plane than anything else, because, like, every time I've gotten on a plane over the last couple of years, it's there, so I watch it. I'm like, this is how Denis wanted me to watch this film on the, on the smallest, dirtiest screen with the worst sound possible. Um, 
but really it is worth it is worth just trying even traveling a little bit farther to to see it properly in IMAX or or at least the best sound experience that you can probably get to yeah and the, the one thing I'll, I'll I'll say about IMAX is that at least from from my impression my experience that there is quite a big difference between one IMAX theater and, and another uh so I think that depending on you know whether you go to like one that really has a great execution or uh, one that's that's maybe um a bit smaller or or the, the sound isn't set up as well you can have a quite a wide widely different experience so if if you do watch it in in IMAX one time and you, you feel that you're not impressed like definitely give it a, a try in another theater as well yeah there's theaters that lie that say it's IMAX it's not really IMAX is it <laughs> they, they lie. I remember that's the part one because uh when Paul and Jessica are running from the worm that's quite a dark scene and I saw some people complaining that their theater it was almost black you, you couldn't see anything um, so if you've, if they've not calibrated the projector properly or whatever they do, then you know, that can make a huge difference. Hey, Marcus, if I can just add to that, um, I, I remember seeing Dunkirk. So we have two IMAX screens, uh, within, you know, 10 or 15 miles of me. And I remember seeing Dunkirk and they had not, <laughs> it's like when you turn on your home theater system and the last person to use it had it cranked up almost to a hundred. It's like that first shot where that. Um, where the main character's running and the, and the bullets are shooting behind him. It was so loud. The people covered it's like their It's painful. Ears. Yeah. Yeah, it hurt. And, and so, interestingly enough, that theater, um, I have had less of a perfect ex uh, IMAX experience, whereas the other theater that I'm going to in a, in a couple of weeks here, they, for whatever reason, they just are meticulous about having the sound calibrated correctly, the image on the screen. And so I, I go to that one. It should be the same experience, right? IMAX is a brand, but for some reason, it can be different, like you said, Marcus. Okay, next, on uh, February 2nd, there was a special screening of Tenet on IMAX 70 millimeter film, and that also included a five-minute clip from Dune Part 2, uh, reportedly the Harvester attack. And afterwards, we got a insightful discussion between the directors, Christopher Nolan and Denis Villeneuve. They sat down to talk about cinema. And that conversation has uh, been re released just this past week to YouTube and contains some discussion on Dune Part 2. Uh, notably, uh, Nolan compares uh, Dune Part 2 to The Empire Strikes Back. And knowing that many of us are also big Star Wars fans, interested to hear your reactions to that comment. Uh, Rachel, I'll let you go first. Sure. I think it has more to do less with it being like the best Star Wars movie, which, you know, that it's arguable, but it is my favorite Star Wars movie. Um, and more to, like, more to do with, I think, the the subversion of expectation of a sequel um you know empire famously ends on kind of like a down note right like our our heroes are kind of kicked and they've been beaten and you know what are they going to do um so i feel like that's it's pointing more towards what we've seen in other interviews where they say this ending is tragic it is heartbreaking um so yeah i think that's what they mean but interested to hear what what y'all think yeah, because um, really, June Messiah is that Empire Strikes Back, the subverting of expectations. And it, uh, from all the interviews, uh, it's, it sounds like uh, what's uh, sort of hidden and sort of if you reread it, you can see what's going to happen in Messiah. But Villeneuve seems to have brought that to the forefront. So it's not uh, subtle anymore. It's like there's no chance that you will come out of this thinking that Paul's the good guy. Uh, so I think, yeah, that subversion of expectations is the comparison but it also sounds like it's a great film as well so <laughs> with good action sequences and yep. yeah and the uh, empire has got a, a giant worm in it as well doesn't it so <laughs> yeah. yeah on an asteroid <laughs> so i i agree with with both of you uh on on the the relationship and why uh nolan uh compared dune 2 to uh, empire um the other the other angle that i took as i was listening to that interview for the fourth time I loved that interview. Um, what I also think is we all saw Star Wars uh, episode, the, the original Star Wars episode four, and, and then it introduced us to this world, right? It established the characters. And then, I mean, I was like nine years old when I went, but I went to see Empire and suddenly the whole universe just expanded. And, and I was introduced to these new characters and new, new spaceships and new uh, technology and, and things of that nature, but yet the characters is what held me. Right. And, and obviously the, the incredible reveal about, you know, uh, 
you're my, I, you know, I'm your father. So what, what I like about the comparison is, are we going to have those substantial reveals like in empire? And are we going to have this incredible expansion of the universe? And if I'm a betting man, I'm going to say, yes, I'm both, but I just think it's an excellent comparison. Also the tone, the tone of empire is very different from, from uh, a new hope. And, and I also love that about empire. And I just think there's going to be a lot of intensity, both emotionally between the characters, between Paul and Shawnee. I, I just think there's a lot of cool comparisons and I'm excited. So you're expecting a revelation of, of, about some sort of parentage or grandparentage in my, <laughs> I might be. <laughs> I think it's also, you know, when you, you you're right and to go back to that star Wars comparison, it's like. You have your your good guys and your bad guys, and you think that you're watching uh, a conflict between good guys and bad guys, and then you get to the end and you realize that this is a much more complicated story and a much more complicated problem than just good guys versus bad guys. And it's not, and that you may in fact be part of the problem, or at least more involved in it than than just being in opposition to, you know, Vader or the Emperor or whatever. So yeah, I like that. I like that you're. I think it's going to be a much more i mean they they kind of emphasize that this is going to be a character driven story despite the fact that it's also probably going to be a lot of action and i think they i think that that focus is really important to me as just a person going to see the film right Cause it's like yeah i really want to see giant sandworms and stuff blow up like for sure <laughs> but you know i'm i'm drawn to the story through the characters right so yeah and at the end of Empire, you know, Luke rejects the offer of joining the dark side. Yeah. But uh, that's not really the case for June, is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or what I like how uh, Denis kind of alluded to the Floyd in the loop. He said, um, you know, for those that know the book so well, um, my, my version may be a little different. He, he was very subtle with what he said. I, I trust me, I listened to this over and over. But then he said, I'm staying true to Frank Herbert. I, I, I'm, I want to stay true to Frank Herbert's characterization of Paul and the evolution of Paul. He didn't use those words. But, and, and so for just a second, I got, I got worried in that interview because I'm like, wait a minute, is he, is he going to take some really major departures from, from what I know and love? But, but I, he, he brought me back down to earth when, when he said, I, I'm, I will be true to, to Frank Herbert. But. Another comparison to Empire is look how the, the complexity and the mythology and the psychology all went to like a whole new layer of depth. Mm -hmm. And that's what I also anticipate with, with Dune Part 2, because we really do have a very complex protagonist, but we've got a whole host of other complexities with the relationships between the good guys and the bad guys. Well, that's the great thing about Dune, right, is... It's it's Star Wars for for nihilists or <laughs> doesn't really matter what you choose. They, somebody's getting hurt in the process, right? And and the other interviews, I think uh, Zendaya was alluding to that that hurt and that that problem, especially in the endings. There was a conversation about the the looks between uh, Chani and Irulan at the end. And apparently Villeneuve uh, was doing quite a lot of uh, storytelling just by looks, by the sounds of it. So uh, a lot of it is expressed just in, uh, I forgot what he, what he called it now, but just brief moments of people looking at each other to to tell the story. Yeah, like passing shots or something yeah. like that where, yeah, it's where, and, and to go back to the IMAX discussion, you know, they said that because of the huge format, they were able to really focus on those looks and those emotional beats in characters' faces and their eyes. And, um, yeah, I just can't, I can't wait to cry. <laughs> it's going to be so good. Yeah. There's a shot in one of the trailers of, uh, Shaney giving the stink eye to someone. And I, I think that's Irulan. <laughs> Rachel, I'm going to be crying whenever there's an ornithopter on the screen. So I'll be crying a lot. I'm building my Lego right now. And let me tell you, it's so cool. I remember actually, um, I think I might've said this in another episode, but when I saw the first preview of Dune part one, it was the, the harvester scene with the ornithopter. And I, as soon as I saw the design, I thought, oh, I'm fine. 
everything's going to be okay because this is everything I've ever wanted because it's supposed to be insect-like, but it still needs to look like it can actually get off the ground and like do things and not just like flutter around like a weird bat. Um, it's just, yeah, the sensibility of, of everything that is, and it goes back to the Star Wars conversation. It's it, the tactileness of the, of the objects and the in-universe technology is so cool. And, and once you've got it set up and once it just looks grimy and awesome and impossible, even if you don't understand how it works, right? It's not Star Trek. We have no idea how any of it works, but it looks great. And it looks like people touch buttons and move things and stuff moves when you move one thing. And I just love that that's established. We get to play in it more and and blow stuff up more. And <laughs> anyway, yeah. You know, Nolan actually complimented uh, Villeneuve on that when what he said you know you're introducing us to all this new stuff I, I think he even said mines and the sand and stuff like that but but i love that here here's a, a creative person uh, at the level of christopher nolan who who is saying to to denis you know you you introduced all these new things to us but but it all i i understood it like I, it it felt real Th those are not his words but uh, I just thought that was a really cool compliment coming from one creative uh, genius to another. Um, that that Denis really did his homework. He did he he made the sacrifice to make the thopters look and feel real. He made yeah. the sacrifice to make the sandworms feel somehow like it could evolve out of some world nature system. You know, it's just that. The, the dedication, I think, has really paid off. And, and I think we're going to see even more of it because we're going to be introduced to some things in this part, too, that we're not familiar with. Yeah, form informs function and function informs form, right? And I think we're very used to, in science fiction particularly, that things look cool, but it doesn't really indicate what it does. And the great thing about what Denis has done with the production design and, and the look of these Dune films is that it let, might look cool, but it also looks like it can do what it's supposed to do, what its, what its function is, whether it's a crawler or a thopter or a thumper. Um, yeah, I really like that sensibility of, of reality but also it still looks futuristic it still looks like nothing that we have here but at the same time it's also not computerized as well yeah th yeah. it's practical yeah, oh, yeah. it's going to look so good in 25 years 30 years it's still going to look great yeah so as mentioned up top uh, following that uh, press junket um, there's been like a literal sandstorm of uh, interviews uh, coming out there and uh, some of them are, are, of course, just those those typical questions that actors get asked all the time. But there were a good amount of insights to be uh, found uh, among them. Um, yeah, one one of the things that uh, Rachel you you had noted is that uh, Denis is openly calling Paul an antihero. You know, he doesn't even consider that a, a a spoiler. Like, what are your thoughts on that? I feel great vindication as a as a book fan and as a person who I mean, I'm not on Twitter anymore. But when I was on Twitter, um, I got into many arguments with people about. You know, Dune is, is, Paul's not a hero. Dune is not a story of a hero. It's, you know, um, you don't want to be Paul. If you see yourself in Paul, you need to look in the mirror. And, and you know, I don't want to like be very spoilery, but like those things are very important to me in my interpretation and experience of reading, of reading these novels. So it's very cool to, before the movie even comes out, before we even get to consume it as, as, as viewers, that the director is sitting there telling interviewers and telling people, put this in pr print. He's, he's an anti-hero. And that's what Frank Herbert meant. And I'm being true to that. Um, it makes it non-ambiguous. It's just exciting <laughs> to think, oh, yeah, all right, we're going to get the real story and not the, you know, the palatable arc, right, that we've gotten in other adaptations. Yeah, I mean, all the other adaptations, apart from the, the miniseries, you know, all the other adaptations are very much a hero's journey. Uh, yes. The emphasis being on the hero there. And even Lynch's Messiah script uh, brushes over the 61 billion deaths thing. So, you know, Paul is still sort of a hero. He, he's perhaps sort of the varnish has worn off, the polish has worn off a little bit. You know, he's the fact that we are actually getting a director who has read all the books. Yeah. <laughs> knows knows the uh the point of the story and what frank herbert was trying to get across 
And he was actually allowed to make a story where your, you know, your superstar, Timothy Chalamet, uh, isn't the poster child that, the, you know, you want him on the lunch boxes and everything. So, uh, very excited yeah. to actually see this on the big screen as Frank Herbert presumably intended. Right. And perhaps we needed to get through the kind of traditional hero arc, you know, the last 25 years of, of, of films where we go and we want to see the good guys win. Maybe we needed to get through that, especially, you know, in a post pandemic world, like maybe we're ready for that kind of story to be a popular story and not a very niche, you know, genre fans kind of story. And then we, we also had some uh, interesting uh, conversations with, uh, uh, Florence Pugh and uh, Zendaya, especially on the, the ending of, of the movie. Um, one of the quotes where, where Zendaya actually mentioned that the, that ending will feel heartbreak, uh, heartbreaking. It's, it's emotional. And uh, Florence Pugh was, was talking about when she read the, the, the ending of the, of the script, uh, she, she was, had a whole different awareness of, of Princess Erlan, how she's really aware of you know, like what's, what's happening and uh, gives a different perspective because during the whole movie, she's sort of like listening to, to what's going on, but at the end, she's like really going there uh, with her eyes open. Uh, Garen, and any thoughts in terms of the um, like what they're talking about the, this ending? Yeah, and we've talked in some earlier episodes of the show. You know how how does Villeneuve handle that ending? Um, because it's it's critical to the story and to the to the to, to Messiah. Actually, um, I was actually kind of pleased to hear that, like we talked in our last episode, which all of us were on, uh, that that Irlan really is observing she's watching everything she's absorbing all the minutia and all the details so so what does that mean at the end um i my, again i'm just speculating and, I, and and no spoilers here but my speculation is that she's going to have an influential uh moment or moments at the end that is a culmination of her observing and even as we talked last time, counseling her father, the emperor. And so I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited about what this could mean, but again, I love this, uh, this expansion, or like we talked about last time, elevation of a character like, like Hirolan. And, and, and again, think about why, why did Villeneuve select Florence Pugh? She, she's a, she's a powerful actor. She's, she's a formidable presence on the screen. Um, and, and so having that as, 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 as who choosing Florence as that character, I think kind of reveals that, that this is a character that unlike the book, who is just kind of hovering in the background or is the, uh, historian of the story that she actually is going to have some major influence, uh, at the end. So really loved that. Yeah. Certainly Florence has a very emotive face and, and gives so much with just those micro movements um mm. so that you know again we're talking about those like those passing shots of people's faces even if they don't have a line those that connection that we're going to be able to feel uh through the camera that'll be really cool i also think it's really nice that we may you know i don't know if we're going to get any kind of explicit betty jesuit kind of plotting um in the movie but it's nice that their effect, the training that she has received throughout her life will be, you know, a detail in her ob observational skills, right? Like, and, you know, because we don't really have, like, we have Mentats walking in and out, but we don't, we're, we're not reading it. We don't really know what that is. So to spend the time to establish that kind of, um, uh, that that skill, the observational skills, and all of the the internal thinking and planning and plotting that's happening constantly with all of these characters uh, translated to the screen. It's exciting that you know you know the movie's more than what it's almost three hours long, so we get the time to to have that developed. Yeah, I'm just wondering how the film is going to end uh, in the relationship between Paul and Cheney and Irulan. Is it going to be as the book, or we've we've talked about before if there's Perhaps going to be a, 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 a scene after that, that with some sort of ceremony uh, between them. Oh. Um, I, yeah, that'd be cool. Which, which, might, which might be that sort of heartbreaking scene. You know, it's yeah. one thing to say an event is going to happen, but to actually see that committed might be, might be what's being referred to. I don't know. That's an interesting idea, uh, Mark. And 
And if you go back, I think it was the Mexico uh, interviews that I think Zendaya said, she said, I can't really say much, but, but Chani deals with some really heavy stuff, right? I, I think she chose that word heavy for a reason. And, um, and, and we have talked on this show a little bit about, about some of those things, but if your theory is right, Mark, that could also be a, a very heartbreaking, emotional ending, um, that is very heavy. So, um, I, I yeah, kind of like, well. Yeah, I think it was Johnny or Simon who, who mentioned that based on what we saw in the previous trailer. So I can't take credit for that. But if it's wrong, <laughs> I'll blame them. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at uh, uh, Flores Pugh's uh, wardrobe for, for your line. It definitely looks that sh sh some of those outfits would, would, would be fit for a wedding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's got like a, a veil in one. and I think she's going to be the Lady Jessica of this one with a different costume in every scene that she's in. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, then, it's funny because I think there was also just like banter between her and Zendaya in some of the interviews where she was like, I got to wear all these cool things. And the book Zendaya is just in a still suit, a grimy <laughs> still suit. And the, and the, there was one one of the interviews uh, like where Timothy Chalamet was, was, was talking about like the um, uh, duality between uh, Paul and Fade about how they have um, basically a, the same potential, but they're like opposed to each other. And like we see that striking shot when they're first uh, about to have the, the, the knife fight. Uh, Mark, what, what, what do you make of that comment of uh, um, Paul and, uh, and Fade being almost equally opposing forces? Yeah, um, it's absolutely true because, you know, in theory, Paul should have been a Paula or something and, you know, they, they would have been wed. So, you know, they are both the product of the Benny Gesserit uh, breeding program, um, just one step away from where they should have been. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, you know, both, sons or uh, nephews of the of the duke or the baron uh, both being trained um different sorts of training paul is very much honorable training and fade is very much a ferocious training but again both trained in fighting uh both have killed people um so yeah it will be they, they should be equally matched on paper uh, but you know paul has got a few uh, tricks up his sleeve i what a happy marriage it would have been. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, wow. Political, political in nature for sure. He, I, you know, I love that, that comment that Timothy made in that, in the interview where he, he kind of like was trying to lead the interviewer to a discussion about that. And then it kind of like went off to another place. Um, but I appreciated that. I appreciated that he's so thoughtful about this character. And I mean, you know, he's a great actor, so. Maybe I'm underestimating him, but uh, it was, I appreciated that he had that insight into the character um, and that they themselves approached their fight scenes in that way, right? Where they, they kind of were like, either of us could win. Um, and the train, and there's so much discussion of how, all the training that they did and how quickly the fights were. And then they even said uh, that there's definitely large one shot. Um, takes of the entire fight uh it would be wonderful to see we're hearing the, the cast talk but hearing them talk we get so much insights into uh, the approach from from uh, villeneuve and, and how he's he's guiding them the whole time uh so one of the things i thought was was funny about uh, with um with josh brolin about uh then he was was telling him you know to lose weight and uh yeah that, that just co comes back to i, I feel like uh, Denis, he, he really wants the actors to feel like like their char their characters physically. Like also with uh, Stellan Skarsgård, like having to like spend you know eight eight hours like getting all the makeup on and getting getting that that suit on. And like uh, he, uh, Stellan talked about like you know how he feels heavier, his his movements are are slower, and it really helps him to, to get into the character. You know, I can imagine them them saying uh, you know when they're making the suit, oh this is going to be quite heavy. Do you think we should try to like lighten it and then? Then he was probably like saying, "No, no, 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 that, that, that's good. We we wanted to feel feel heavy." Like I remember when when we interviewed um, uh, Richard Carter, one of the Harkonnen troopers from the Orientopter scene, and he was talking about how Denis wanted them to be sweating in in that scene, like actually like sweating buckets and like really feeling in that moment. So I just lo loved all, all, all those uh, those things. Let me capture your suffering. I think Dave said that as well. That he was at some point is hanging off something when like shooting a gun or. Uh, and they, the interviewer was like, oh, does that CGI? He's like, no, I was hanging <laughs> off of that. Yes. <laughs> it's real. Yeah. I mean, uh, Denny said something similar in one of the interviews as well about 
how he, it was the IMAX interview. He says, you know, he, he scripts it all and then he storyboards it all, the entire film. And then because the storyboards um, impact the script. Uh, but then once you get on the, on, C, on set, uh, nature uh, overrides the storyboards, which overrides the script. And so then he, he, he loves to be prepared. He's always wanting that reality in there which is why there are so few green screens in his things. And so much is practical as much as thought it can be practical. Great. I liked uh, the, I think it was the Mexico interviews where um, the question was asked, I think of Josh Brolin, you know, uh, you know how has Denis, you know, influenced and, and how does he direct you or something along those lines. And, and I loved how um, Josh Brolin talked about the moment when in part two, when he sees Paul again and, and how, um, he, he said, he said, Josh, I need you to be more vulnerable. I need you to be more, I don't know if he used the word emotive or whatever word he used. And, and, and so Josh Brolin, you know, really, really did that. And it kind of came from a place of, cause he really does feel like a mentor, you know, to Paul Gurney does. And, and maybe, maybe it's possible even Josh felt some mentorship of, of, uh, of Timothy, perhaps I'm, I'm just speculating, but then this moment, which, which is caught on camera, I guess they said they, they, they printed the first take on that one because it, it felt real. Like it was this emotional reunion between Gurney and Paul and that it really worked. And so to me, when I hear stories like that, it, it really shows the skill and talent of these directors, but they can they can guide these incredible actors to, to be able to show something that is more vulnerable, more real. Uh, it puts me more in, in a space of reality with, with the moment of the story. Hopefully yeah, the uh, Academy uh, recognizes that as well uh, next year. Yeah, certainly it's, it's um, exciting to see that all of these actors who, you know, we, we watch press tours all the time for films and they trot the actors out and they all say a lot of nice things about me, about their jobs. But the, these, in these interviews, it really does seem very sincere and that it was a collaborative process between themselves and, and, and Denis of, of creating these characters and getting what they both needed to, to really shine. Um, Josh was like, yeah, I lost weight. And then I realized I wasn't fit enough because this, the fights were going too fast, which is also exciting. Seems like he, if he had to work really hard, it's going to look really good. Um, and then there was that really great anecdote from Dave about how he asked Denis for, for notes. And he said, let me go dream about it and I'll get back to you. I thought that was really cool. Very in Dune. I think he said the same thing for part one as well. Uh, so that seems to be Denny's other uh, answer to the style of a dream. So. Yeah. Well, he talked about that in, in that interview with Nolan. He said, he said, I, the, the bulk of my time is that, that script writing, the, the screenwriting portion of the creative process. But he said, I spend so much of my time just dreaming about this story, almost like he described it as though he has the whole thing kind of dreamt out in his mind before he even, uh, you know, puts pen to paper or, or I guess, you know, sketches the, uh, you know, all the, all the images for, uh, for the film. But I, I just love the idea of the, the director immersing almost like a, almost like a Eastern meditative kind of exercise of going into the story before it's created to create it in your own, in your own mind, in your own dream state. And, and, and I think that may be one of his uh, tools for success because Villeneuve's films just have such a complete cohesive kind of feel to them, in my opinion. And I, and I know that doesn't take, I don't want to take anything away from uh, the screenwriters and all the collaboration at that level, but, but they just feel like a whole, uh, piece of creative work. They don't feel disjointed and all over the place and chaotic. They, they feel like all the parts connect. And, and I wonder if that's the result of this, uh, exercise in, uh, spending time in a dream state as he's creating these stories. Yeah. One of the uh, best bits from the IMAX interview, I thought was, uh, there were, he was talking about the storyboard process because Nolan only storyboards the bits he needs to. And then he said that that was because when he was young and wanted to be a filmmaker, he didn't have a camera. Yeah. So all he could do was with his friend, draw the films. Mm -hmm. 
So he, that, that's his process because of the lack of a camera. Uh, and I'm just wondering if that's kind of his unique uh, skill or ability is he, he became a filmmaker without a camera. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and what I like about that is there's no limitations, right? So, so being able to, you know, and, and, and this show is not about, you know, Villeneuve's future uh, projects, but Villeneuve is going to be able to go anywhere right? With whatever project he does, because if he is first mapping it out in a, in a, in a dreamlike experience, then he can do absolutely anything and there's no limitations, but thank goodness he understands the creative limitations because he's that experienced and that skilled. So the end result is something that really works for the mass audience, which is what's happening with Dune and Dune part two. And it elevates it, right? Because, you know, at the end of the day, this movie is hoping to make as much money as possible and appeal to the broadest audience as possible. But Denny is an artist. And I think everyone involved is an artist. And that kind of high art mindset, um, but still giving it to... It's not that they're making a high art movie for a high art viewing audience, right? Like, they want everyone to watch this. It's being offered to all of us. And they're not going to compromise uh, on that quality, which I think makes it really special. And certainly, I mean, I'm biased because Dune is my favorite novel, but I'm, I love that that's what we get in the adaptation, right? It's not like let's capitalize on science fiction being popular right now and book adaptations being popular right now, and we'll just push this out. Like he said, I was born to make this film. Um, so it's exciting that Technology and time and talent have all converged. I think you said something in previous interviews as well about how part one was basically an indie movie, but with a big budget. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's what it feels like. It's, it's not your uh, boilerplate popcorn superhero movie. This is hard sci-fi uh, done, but with a big budget. So something that would normally be like a little indie film uh, that picks up a few awards has suddenly got like, hundreds of millions of dollars from behind it. Definitely some, uh, some nice insights to, to be uncovered in these interviews. We've been gathering them uh, up on, on the site, so, uh, so check, check that out. Uh, we also had um, an interesting new still that dropped uh, featuring Bade, and this one might be a bit spoilery. Uh, Mark, for the benefit of our listeners, describe what's shown in this picture and also which scene do you think this could be? Uh, so this is a picture of Fade, and behind him are uh, some Harkonnen troops. Uh, so on the face of it, not very interesting, but behind him, it looks like uh, what we've seen before for the Fremen, uh, and this has been the stills using the background of some of the publicity interviews. Uh, so it's like a, a cavern, but then with hose on the side, which are sleeping quarters or something perhaps, so perhaps a siege. So suddenly we've got the idea that the Harkonnens are in a siege and Fade is leaving them. Uh, and there's been another shot before uh, in one of the trailers of a Fremen kneeling down with some dead birds in front of her. And the Harkonnen at the front is wearing a cape. So we didn't know who it was, but in this image, you can just see that Fade has got some cape straps coming down. And we know the McFarlane toy, Fade has, uh, Fade has got a cape in that. Um, so this is probably Fade leading the Harkonnen troops into a siege. Uh, now, he could be doing something very uh, evil in that siege. Uh, which would tie into our conversations last time about Paul and Fade's fight being personal or not. Uh, don't know if that's the case or if he's just uh, going around slaughtering Fremen, but it's a very suggestive image. I, I don't know how spoilery we want to go here, uh, Marcus. Yeah, I think since we're to the, to the end of the, towards the end of the episode, let's just go full spoiler mode. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> well full, full spoiler mode here is the first thought I had is if you're going to, if you're going to, raise the stakes and the emotion of of Paul and Chani losing their firstborn. If if you have fade infiltrating and doing something horrific uh in, in the death of that child, then then this would kind of fit that. You know, you're suddenly gonna be like, okay, I really hate fade now, right? As opposed to, okay, he's a heart connect, he's evil, he's bloodthirsty, blah, blah, blah. But then if this were to happen in that storyline, suddenly all the emotional stakes are raised. And, and I suddenly hate this guy beyond belief and I want to see him die, right? 
So that was the thought that came to me. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Making that fight really personal, that duel, because it's not just for the future of Arrakis, the future of, you know, th this, this vengeance quest. It's the future of House Atreides, right? So. What's interesting is in uh, the, one of the Paramount scripts uh, back in 2008, I think it was, 2010, um, and that on the attacking uh, Araikin at the start, Fade leaves the Harkonnen troops and kills Jublito. Uh, so there's no Dr. you in a poison gas tube in, in that script. But we do have the fact that Fade is ki killing Leto. And perhaps we're getting the same storyline <laughs> in this one, but just uh, sort of moved <laughs> further down the, the plot. Leto to the first... Leto, two. <laughs> I don't, one and a half. I've seen Leto one and a half. That's cute. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> but but Frank Herbert, you know, he it, it's almost like a teaser, right? Because Frank Herbert is so vague on that uh, detail around yeah. the death of uh, Leto two, um, almost like he was leaving it open <laughs> for future uh, cinema uh, adaptations. But um, to me. That just makes total sense in creating the level of, I mean, again, good versus bad. It's not, it's not that clear, right? But just the, the relationship between these two houses, even though there's been this long standing generations of, of, you know, bloodshed and we get that in part two, it's, it's clear to us, it's described to us. And, and yet now if something this personal, because the death of a child, the death, someone deliberately killing my child, right? It's just inconceivable that it just sends the, the characters in a, in a whole new direction and perhaps motivations. So um, I, I, I love the idea. I, I think it would make it super intense. Uh, one of my pet theories on uh, David Lynch's Dune is, you know, it'd be interesting to see the film from Fate's point of view. Because uh, his, so many of his scenes are cut out, like torturing Dr. Yui and torturing Duke Leto. Mm -hmm. So from his point of view, you've got this upstart who's disrupting the Imperium with spice production. They've killed his uncle uh, and they're, tr they're trying to take the throne. You know, why wouldn't you want to you know, defend the Emperor's honor? So yeah, in some ways, you know, Fade could be the hero of Lynch's Dune if you look at it from a point of view. <laughs> That is a, I can't, that is, a, that is a take I have never. Thought. Yeah. <laughs> that is amazing. But it's I love all these, all, you know, Sting says about three work lines in the whole movie. So yeah. Got the, <laughs> you know, he has been brought up by, you know, this lecherous old man. So you I can feel right. something to fit for him. Um, so, you know, he, he's the, uh, he's been put upon. He's, he's a good guy. I mean, that list that you kind of just went through, even though it's for the Lynch version, it's um, it does remind me that, like, you know, a lot of the atrocities that the Harkonnens uh, kind of commit have been a little bit removed. And in, in this adaptation, in part one, we don't see as much. We know that they're bad because they do bad things and the Fremen say they're bad. And, you know, they do a little bit. Obviously, you know, Leto uh, is murdered, but um, we don't get like Piter is kind of off you know, really quickly and his like kind of weird motivations aren't really in there. Um, so yeah, giving him something else to do that really does prove that, that gurney line of like, no, they're, they're, they're monsters, um, would definitely like build them up as a villain. I mean, we've got the gladiator scene, which is something right. in, in Lynch. But it's not happening like to our characters, to yeah. our, you know, to, to on Arrakis. Yeah. You know, um, in, in the in the Mexico interviews, uh, I think Austin Austin kind of alludes to some, you know, what's the backstory of Fade? Like he, I can't remember exactly how he worded it, but it was like it was so fun. It's like he was saying it was so exciting to to embody this character who's who's evil, but yet there's always the motivations and the reasons for why they're evil, right? He was kind of touching on that. Um, and I don't know if that's a big reveal or if I'm just reading into it too much, but that might kind of point to your theory, Mark, but maybe we are going to have a lot more insight into Fade's motivations and his perspective um, just because, 
you know, why else would Austin say that? Or it's important to the story because otherwise if we just have sort of these evil guys dressed in black, but it's just sort of opaque and it doesn't make any sense as to why, um, I just, I love that idea. I think it could really add a lot of emotion and, uh, and heartbreak. And that could be the heavy things that Zendaya is referring to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, we, uh, Villeneuve has said that we're getting a lot more Harkonnen in um, part two. So ho- hopefully we see a bit more explanation, uh, exploration of Fade's background and his character and his uh, evil acts. Yeah, yeah and, and it'll make that other that other reveal a little bit more horrible too, right? Yeah. Yeah, more, more shocking. Yeah. Yeah, it's potentially uh, because we were saying, you know, we're going to have this, this fight between Paul and Feta at the end. And, you know, h- how are you going to make the, the audience feel for that fight and really feel invested in it? And, and of course, I think what, what we're seeing now is that we're going to see a lot of Fade. So, of course, even in the arena fight, you know, we're going to see like how he's a monster and he does kill Lieutenant Landville, which is, uh, you, you know, like an, an Atreides lieutenant who had interacted with other characters. So we're going to re- already start to feel that connection. Um, and now see, seeing that he's actually on Arrakis before the events uh, of the end of the film, and he's, you know, obviously going to kill some, some Fremen. I think that's going to like even more like uh, make us, you know, like hate him as, as a character and make us more invested in, in that, uh, that final fight. So I think that there's two main possibilities that, that I'm thinking like one is that, you know, you know, he's going there and he's going to kill uh, you know, the, the child of, of Paul and, and Shani, later the, the second. Um, and, and that's actually what I've been, been thinking, like, since we got the first trailer with that shot, shot of Shish Hockley uh, on, on the floor and, like, those two, two, two Sea Lago. Yeah. Um, that's, that's one possibility. The, the other possibility is, uh, let, let's say that the child isn't involved in, in that scene, but it could be that, you know, like, uh, Fade is leading an attack personally on, on a siege, and he just, like, kills a lot of people who are, uh, friends of, of Paul and Chani. So we know that Shish Hockley, we saw her in the, in the sandworm riding scene and she also already had, uh, like a close relationship with, with Chani and she was already, uh, you know, playful with Paul. So like her death would be meaningful and assuming that she gets killed, that there will be other people that they knew there. So uh, even just that, 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 you know, it's, you know, like a, a bunch of, uh, people on that siege get slaughtered by the Harkonnens, that would already be, um, you know, like a terrible experience. Uh, you know, I can imagine. Uh, Chani and Paul like returning to the siege and realizing it's been completely ravaged and you know like dozens of people that that they knew have just been uh, been slaughtered by by the Harkonnens. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm just imagining, you know, what kind of what kind of fear is going to be induced on the audience if we we now feel that the Harkonnens, led by Fade, are now going to hit Paul where he's most vulnerable, right? His friends, the people he yeah. loved, the people that have been true to him, the people that he is now uh, convincing that he is on their side and that he is even their leader, right? And then Fade is like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go right for the jugular for you, Paul. And, mm-hmm. and as the audience feels this happening, we can sense, you know, that Fade and even that look on his face in that image, you know, that, it, it just it reminds me of uh, the Nazi leader in Schindler's List, where he just has this look on his face of like, I don't understand why you're important, but I understand you're important to my enemy, and I'm going to take you out, and and I'm going to I'll make you suffer, and 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 that just that level of evil uh, would be something that Fade would embody because he is so bloodthirsty, but I can just imagine kind of the roller coaster ride the audience is going to have in this film because we're going to have all this guerrilla warfare and 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 you know incredible like images of, of battle but then probably the most impactful things we're going to feel are going to be things like this mm-hmm. like Whitman you're going to go after this child you're going to go after these people we love and care about you know and then we're and then we're really we're really in it this time his person it is. It is. And it's the threat of Paul having everything taken from him one by one. I think there's another um, shot somewhere floating around of Sade saying something about Chani, right? Like noticing mm-hmm. her saying, there she is, Paul. And uh, uh, I'm paraphrasing that, but I can't remember the actual quote. Yeah. But it's like, I've seen her. I'm going to take her. Right. And that implies that maybe he's taken something else or maybe something other, de- you know, other devastating um 
action has made Paul just that much more angry and that that much more invested in this particular line, course of action. I kind of wish it had been the same line of uh, Sting had. You know. Oh, <laughs> I wish you would buy my special attention. Yes. Yes. I wish that I wish that the that the metal diaper had had made it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll be in the back. I think Austin said something about that. He was like, "Well, I'm really glad the cod piece didn't come back with that." <laughs> <laughs> on, on on that note, uh, one thing we have to address: Dune popcorn bucket. Is this a heretical use of Shai Halud or is it marketing? <laughs> it's not that heretical use of Shai Halud. You know, I actually maintain that Frank Herbert would love the popcorn bucket just because, uh, you know, we kind of, we know that he was like a little perverse sometimes. So right. I feel like he would have been like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more sort of uh, heretics of June in Chapter House June. It's yeah, like, yeah, no. <laughs> it's a tool, okay? Let's, sure. It's a tool later on. But you know, I, I you guys is killing me. Okay, <laughs> I I just think that they're sort of upset that you know Lynch's merchandise has always been held up as like the most weird merchandise, and they're yeah. just trying to take its crown. So, yeah, they're letting they're letting the audience know that this is this, this going to make you an experience. I, I think I think the sandworms would agree. I mean, whatever it takes, right, to get the attention <laughs> on the movie. Let's let's do it. I think the designer of that is either being promoted or fired. I can't figure out which. <laughs> it's funny too, because like I, if if like if I if it was up to me, like that's my job. Um, I would have made it like a like a Slurpee container for like a Water of Life kind of like reference, oh, yeah. where it's like you can drink out of it. But you know, we'll oh. just pull popcorn out of it in a weird way. It, it's struggle. I mean, it's the struggle of having to eat your popcorn, right? You have to work for it. <laughs> It is heretical, though. <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, yeah, we're going to wrap it up for today. Uh, one note that I do want to say, is, as mentioned in the, in the last episode, there there are some big spoilers out there. Uh, like some people are, you know, really interested in discussing them. Some people like are wanting to avoid them. So we're we're having a, some some thoughts whether we're going to do like a special episode or maybe part of an episode going into that. Uh, so yeah, like uh, if, if you're uh, watching or listening today, let us know, would you like to see us go into those spoilers or would you rather, you know, wait until the movie comes out and then hear our, our full reactions? Just, just let us know. Um, but yeah, like for, for now, let's go ahead and, uh, and sign out. I'm Rachel. You can find me on Instagram at Darth underscore Rachel. And I'm also the host of Bucky Radio, which is a podcast about reading through all the Robin Hobb novels. So thank you. Mark from June Info here. You can follow me on all the socials. Uh, great chat going from infant side to uh, d not safe for word pop song book. It's a public podcast today. Hey, it's Garen. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, really appreciate your support. And please, um, if you disagree with us, please make a comment. Yeah, we, we love all opinions and, and all insights. Um, we're all Dune fans, but it doesn't mean we, we always agree. So uh, just appreciate your support and just enjoy the show today. Yeah, this was uh, Marcus Gabriel. You can find me at Marcus is writing and uh, writing on Do Newsnet and doing a lot of uh, other stuff. Um, yeah, so as as mentioned, we're uh, going more frequently with with Dune Talk uh, for the rest of this this month. So look forward to us uh, midweek and uh, and weekends. Until the next one, take care. We hope you've enjoyed Dune Talk. Remember to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you know when the next episode drops. Stay tuned to DuneNewsNet.com and add us to your social feeds. Be the first to hear breaking news and reviews.